So my talk today is about um, my work and about uh, a kind of philosophy that I have that I want to share with you, which is about our planet and which is about this key word called cybertecture. I believe that we are all pixels on a giant planet, and that planet is our mothership. And that planet Earth can teach us so much about our future. I'm a futurist. I believe that technology and design can create a better world, but that it must be inspired by wisdom and it must be inspired by a balance between what we can achieve as humankind as well as what we can achieve in technology. When we look down from the sky, we see the cities of the world containing the population of our human civilization. The question is, what is that in the 20th century and what can we do in the 21st century? When we see the cities of 20th century, we see them as the great creations of concrete, steel, and glass. They contain the billions of people on this planet. Yet we are seeing that these cities are starting to create problems for ourselves. They're not so sustainable. They're very crowded, and they're not using our energy and our resources in the right way. To make these cities work, we are confronted with creating a kind of whole network of infrastructure, such as roads to get the population of the world to move around, such as the train networks that join our cities and our regions together. But I think more importantly, this kind of innate sense of having to fuel the whole thing, fueling these cities, fueling our civilization, is going to be one of the greatest challenges that we have in the 21st century. And power stations, whether they're nuclear, coal, charcoal, etc., are being used. What is that evolution that we need to do in the 21st century to get to a 21st century city? Are the issues at stake? When we just change our perspective a little bit, i.e. we see the cities from satellites, we see them differently. We see them as grids. And in a way, they're not too dissimilar to a microchip. We see them as an integrated circuit of so many issues, so many organisms, so many economic factors working together. But that powering it through that system is our ability to live our lives, to process information, to communicate intelligence through that network. And we're living in an era now where that simulation of that city is possible. And we only have to look at a game like SimCity. It's a representation of how that city can be understood. The society of these cities have changed. They've changed to become more than just a physicality. We only have to know Facebook to know that we are a community, a global city. And that when we see the world in a different light, that this world is not just about our cities and physical. Here is a map of all of the major servers that serve as the internet around the world. We see the globe in a different way. So how do we move into that? How do we move and enhance that into our cities? And I call that a ubiquitous city. It should not be a city designed like this anymore, where our infrastructure is no longer able to contain our growth. It must be something much more holistic, using new ideas and new technologies. And it can be something like this, which is a U city, able to integrate all of our services, all of our spaces, all of our intelligence in the city so that we can monitor it better. So why must we invent this kind of new infrastructure for the future? Why should we put our efforts into doing so? Well, the reasons are very simple. Our mothership is only a finite space. We only have that much resources. But our world is growing and changing. And if we don't change, if we don't change the way in which we build for ourselves, we will be in trouble. We know that the world's population is growing dramatically. We know that by the year, middle of this century, 50% of the world will be living in cities. Yet we are confronted with these huge challenges about how to feed people, how to get across the wealth divide, how we can get over the famine issues and the growing underdeveloped world. We know that we're using energy in a very unsensible way. Already 30% of the embodied energy in the world goes into our infrastructure. We can't sustain that. But by just trying to sustain it, we are causing everything from pollution. We're changing our world. We're changing the very air that we are breathing. And we must confront those with new creativity. We are faced with the challenges of nature, you know, natural disasters. Yet 
in this day and age, we're still not confronting them in a very good way. And climate change, the very essence that binds us all together, our climate and nature, is changing so fast. Yet our old infrastructure cannot deal with it in a good way. Some has professed that by the year 2025 may become a tipping point, and that that tipping point is a point where we can no longer, as human beings, be able to control that change. And that is very scary. Human beings have always tried to control the environment. But our future is in our own hands, ladies and gentlemen. It really is. I, myself, as an architect, feel I'm doing my small role into trying to do that. And I believe that we are all imagineers, that we can design our own destiny. That is what makes human beings so incredible. So I want to show you some examples of what I'm talking about through the work that we've been doing. So imagine, I think as Imagineers, we must always imagine the possibilities, that buildings can create human sustainability, that that sustainability is about our health, our perspective, our relationships, and not just about the building itself. So for example, a building that is conceived not for itself to be a building, but a container of technologically empowered living that is healthy and wise. In this building, for example, that we've done in Dubai, it's a building that brings perspective to people, that the window is taking the messages around the world and the places around the world to you. But more importantly, in this building, in every space, there are the sensors that are available to monitor the state of your health, the health of your family and friends. When you walk into the bathroom, you actually have a mirror that is able to monitor the state of your health. That's pretty incredible. That's giving you health awareness on a level never achieved before. Imagine that these buildings are in a city which is old, and that city needs to be evolved. How do we do that? Well, in, in a way, we need to find the kind of tool that can make these cities start to think for themselves, a way in which they become self-intelligent and take care of us. When we look at that traditional 20th century city, we can see it as a close conglomeration of buildings. They're kind of pretty stupid. But when we inject a new kind of invention into them, i.e. clever, intelligent sensor poles that can deliver information, garner intelligence from the city, we may be able to evolve that 20th century city into a 21st century city. So here's a little diagram of how that is done. If we see the city as a series of circuit boards, if we inject these sensor poles, these sensor poles can monitor the traffic, the air pollution, the uh, people count. They can deliver information to the people around the city and garner the intelligence back to the government or the people in charge of looking after the city so that they can plan the city better and make it more efficient and use the energy and resources better. And that kind of pole is our first step towards what I call this 21st century city, that we cannot start from scratch again, but we can inject these poles into a city and make everything function that much more sustainably and that much more intelligently. And these are available to us today. These are available intelligent networks through the internet, through sensors, through engineering that we can build. I'm a believer in engineering. I believe we can create these systems and these devices that can really change our cities and make them into better places. Imagine, um, for example, that those buildings start to become like nature. Imagine the pixels in the city start to become naturally inspired ultra green buildings and fundamentally change how buildings are designed and built and how they are seen. I want to show you a project that we're doing in India, which completely follows these edicts. This building is a glass egg, and it's an egg that is quite outstanding in shape, but it's driven entirely by nature. It's like a seed pod. This building has no columns. This building is built completely differently at much lower cost. It is an oval in shape because we've taken the same analogy from nature, where this kind of shape can save over 20% more surface area material compared to an orthogonal building. It is intelligently designed so that the angle of the seed pod faces the sun, so that it is taking the least amount of thermal energy from the sun, and therefore reducing the amount of energy that the building needs to cool itself. It creates 
a new kind of architecture that is completely different from what we know of the city, that it is evolved with an honesty about the environment around itself. And that has been created a lot from our own creativity, but also by the tools we have around us, new intelligent computer-aided design systems that allows us to make things in a very efficient way. This whole building is created out of three different shape panels of glass, intelligent glass, and we can create this entire building just with these three components. And all of this is skills and technologies that is now available to us. I really believe that this building is incredible because it also integrates nature in an interesting way. These little sky gardens carved into this building forms part of the ecology of the building. Underneath this floorboard in the building, all of the potable water in the building flows under the floorboard through the roots of these plants, irrigating the plants, but at the same time being cleansed and recycled in the building. And then what we used to call the roof of the building is no longer a roof, but becomes a building integrated photovoltaic farm that contributes at the moment only 5% of the energy in the building, but in the future may become the holy grail to every building generating all of its own energy. And that would be pretty incredible. Imagine we take that whole scale up to the entire city and we call them planetary cities. Imagine the ability to create entire communities. If we take inspiration from our own mothership, our planet, we know that from there we can learn so much about our home, about our civilization. And we can see that it is a layered, complex network of so many different ecological systems, resource systems, tectonic systems, etc. And by applying these principles, we can start to create these new cities. This, ladies and gentlemen, is the world's single largest built city. It is under construction in the Middle East. It's called the Technosphere. And it contains homes and workspaces and community spaces for 35,000 people. It is about the same height as the, uh, just a bit shorter than the Bank of China. It is 180 meters tall. It is a spherical community able to contain all of the resources that are needed for a city. It is compact in shape so that we can save on the energy that is needed to run all of the circulation inside the systems inside. But it is also about the DNA of creating a city, that using the least amount of material, we all know a sphere can contain the greatest volume with the least amount of materials. That on the surface, all of that material is repeated just like the DNA of any natural figure, that it is able just to repeat over the whole thing and use a kind of mass production, low cost way of creating a sustainable city. At the heart of this uh, city is a community space which we call uh, a Noah's Ark concept, a kind of Garden of Eden. That Garden of Eden is a place where we try to replicate nature with a degree of technology, with a degree of using real nature. Um, inside this valley, uh, there is a 100 meter tall space which is naturally ventilated. We're transplanting plants from all around the world into this valley, so it becomes a little bit like a Noah's Ark containing the nature around the world in this giant kind of uh, 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 valley space. It's a space where there's also a giant river. It's called a valley deliberately because we look at the history and we see that human communities have begun in valleys. They were the place where the fresh water congregated. Oh, here we are. This is the valley. At the bottom of this valley, there's a giant river. That river will be circulating over three million cubic meters of recyclable water in this community. And it will form the heart of the cultural space of this project. There, the water is bubbled through uh, 10,000 tiny little tubes through the water, uh, and the air will come through there, and it will be cooled and hydrated for the actual space itself. So it's a really kind of incredible recreation of what we geographically call a natural valley in the center of the city. And I think this is a kind of new direction that uh, a city doesn't really have the opportunity to do unless it can recreate itself because we are in these kind of established grids of cities and we are not able to create these spaces anymore unless we can start all over again. And in a project like this, this is like starting all over again. Um, there's a community space right at the heart of this. We feel that the intellectual thinking that is necessary for the cities of the future are very important. So right at the heart of this is a silver egg. That silver egg is like a, a brain trust where the community will meet together and think about how this uh, giant city will be run. 
At the top, there is the world's single largest photovoltaic farm. And just like our planet, and I said we're taking a lot of inspiration from our planet, we have the two zones, the zone of the Tropic of Cancer and the Tropic of Capricorn on the western and southern side of this planet. Well, here on our technosphere, we have the same, where we get the most amount of sun and heat. So we've recreated these giant rainforests, which are on the outer skin of this giant sphere, and they act as a kind of solar barrier for the, for the whole structure itself. But they create this amazing kind of reenactment re of nature, cooling the building. And within some of these kinds of uh, rainforests, we actually have giant waterfalls, rock gardens. We transplant nature and life from all over the planet here. We'll have fish from different parts of the world. We'll have aviaries containing birds from around the world. And you know, we really want to try and show to people the kind of biodiversity that is available around the planet in this kind of city. So again, this is a kind of merging of our creativity, our engineering, and nature, a kind of new cyber texture which creates the opportunity for us to, to learn from the planet and then to, to, to reenact them in a megastructure that uses less energy and less resources to run. So they're pretty nice spaces. They're spaces where people can come out, breathe natural air, feel cool, listen to birds, listen to the rustling of the leaves, etc. So our planet is our mothership. I really feel that every day when I'm on this planet. I feel that there's a, there's a phrase that I read from Steve Jobs, which is really amazing. He said, life is short, and if we have a talent, we should try and make a dent in the universe. I think in this room, there's just such amazing conglomeration of talent. Each one of us have a kind of responsibility in our lives to make that little dent. And I think our future is in our own hands that whatever we do, we can create a better planet, we can create a better world, and I think we can really do that very, very brilliantly for the generations to come. Thank you very much.